Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Cotard from the University of Berkeley, who will talk uh, to us about a fuller picture of Brascom Leap inequalities and part type inequalities. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's really nice to see so many participants here. Uh, you know, I guess that's one benefit of having virtual seminars so that people from all over can attend. Um, so, yeah, this talk is about Broskamp Lieb and Barth type inequalities, um, which I'll describe in a minute. And you know, I didn't know exactly what to title the talk. Uh, so, I guess I said a fuller picture of um, because somehow I want to try to put these things in a, in a common context and, and explain it. Now, uh, in general, Broskamp Lieb and Barth type inequalities can be extended to like, or can be formulated in quite general settings. And I focus on one particular setting here, namely uh, kind of Euclidean setting. So I'll describe it in a, in a minute. So, so uh, there's some notation throughout the talk that uh, that'll prevail throughout. So I figured I'd just kind of put it all on a slide and then show you a picture of it to, to kind of give you a visual. And so the basic setting is that I have a bunch of uh, Euclidean spaces. I'll call them EIs and EJs. Uh, I'll leave off the superscript and uh, subscript. But um, basically, these are just you know finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. So RN, think of them as uh, you know I could have just written RN I or RNJ everywhere, but uh, somehow this notation is a bit more compact. And so then I have some some special space E zero, which is the direct sum of of all of the the EIs. And then I have some collection of uh, non-negative real numbers. Uh, just think of them as a, a vector that I'll call C, which is a collection of CIs. Um, kind of think of them as associated to the, these Euclidean spaces, the EIs. And likewise, I have some vector D, which is uh, some set of non-negative real numbers um, associated with the spaces EJ. And then I've got uh, basically a whole bunch of linear maps that uh, send EI to EJ. So these are just uh, indexed by, by the input and output spaces. Okay, so I'll denote that whole collection of maps as BIJ. And then, uh, so just to kind of write all these things in a really compact way, this is, this is just called a datum, CDB. And then throughout, um, you know, I'm really, I try to be really consistent with the, with the indexing and the notation. So that way, um, you know, I don't have to state everything really, uh, really carefully um, and save some real estate on the slides. But FI is just a function, uh, or non-negative function um, whose domain is EI and then GJ is non-negative function whose, whose domain is EJ. Can you guys see my cursor by the way or not? Yes. Yep. Okay, you can see the cursor. Good, thank you. I just want to make sure that I'm not just pointing at things uh, to myself. Okay. And then uh, a centered Gaussian function on some Euclidean space E is, you know, the, the usual thing. Basically, I have some K, think about it as positive uh, definite matrix. And so F is just the, you know, proportional to Gaussian density with, uh, with covariance K. And there's one maybe bit of non-standard notation that I, that I need. Um, and let me describe it here and then let me give you a picture to make it clear. So if I have a bunch of, uh, think of them as positive definite matrices uh, that send you know, EI to EI, I call them AIs, then I let pi of A1 through AK denote the set of big positive definite matrices A that send E0 to E0. Uh, that basically um, satisfy this identity here. So, so really what it is, is I can think of A as some, uh, as some, some bigger matrix. Can I close that? Oops, sorry. View into full screen maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, I wanted to get rid of that thing down at the bottom. So. Uh, the, a bigger matrix A that satisfies this identity for, for all I's. And the way that we should think of this is, if I think about, uh, say, random vectors X I's, which live in the Euclidean spaces, the E I's, each one having covariance um, A I, then this big matrix A is just, you know, basically corresponding to the covariance of some coupling of these, of these vectors. And this notion of coupling is, is quite important. And that's the reason why I use this notation pi here to, to evoke the idea of coupling. 
So I realized that this is like, you know, a crazy amount of notation on one slide. Um, so it's like a, a necessary evil, I think. So let me just put a, put a picture up to show you, uh, at least for me on visual, I, I think of it in terms of a picture. So, so I've got these Euclidean spaces, which I call the EIs. They're the ones indexed by subscripts over here. And the special space E0 is this direct sum of all of them. And then on the right, I've got uh, these other Euclidean spaces, EJs. And then I've got linear maps be between them. And the collection of linear maps is this set B. And then to each uh, Euclidean space, the EIs and EJs, I have some non-negative constants, uh, C over here on the left and D over here on the right. And collectively, all these things together make a datum. And so I'll throughout, again, have these functions, FIs, which are non-negative functions whose domain is the EIs and non-negative functions GJs whose domain is the, the EJs. Okay. And then as I explained before, I, I want to think of these, you know, if I have A1 through AK as positive definite, uh, sy symmetric positive definite matrices, okay, think of them as matrices, then um, A in this set is just a, a big matrix with A1 through AK along the diagonal and that's positive semi-definite. So again, if I, if I think of you know, these things as just the AIs is describing covariances of random vectors that live in the spaces EIs. Then A describes a covariance of, of some coupling of, of all these things. So this is kind of all the notation that we need, uh, but uh, I understand it's, it's quite a bit dull at once. So, so if anyone needs a reminder, be sure to ask. So back to, you know, the topic of this, this talk, which is uh, these Broskamp-Lieb and Bartha inequalities. And so really these are you know, families of integral inequalities with, uh, with Gaussian extremizers. And so the Broskamp lead inequalities can be stated as, as follows, that basically I've got uh, some integral of, of product of functions composed with linear maps can be uh, bounded by the product of integrals of the individual functions raised to some power. And so the best constant in this inequality can actually be computed by considering uh, only um, centered Gaussian functions, the uh, GJs basically uh, in this. And so the Barth inequalities are another family of uh, integral inequalities that, that looks a bit different. On the left is uh, basically a product of integrals of functions FIs. Remember these things have domains EIs. And this can be upper bounded by some integral of, of some funny looking function here. The actual form of this function is, is not so, so important. And again, uh, it, Barth's main result is that in computing the best constant or the sharp constant in this family of inequalities, it suffices to consider uh, just Gaussian functions, Fi's. <clears throat> And so there's a really nice uh, survey by Gardner in 2002 on the uh, Brum-Minkowski inequality. And so he puts all of these things in a nice visual context. And so Broskamp Lieb and Barth inequality is kind of lie at the top of this hierarchy. We can think about them as implying many other inequalities as uh, special cases, in particular, you know, geometric and functional types of inequalities, at least in this Euclidean setting that I'm considering here. And so there's many other inequalities not in this figure, uh, namely like things like Loomis Whitney, uh, Gaussian LSI, so on and so forth. And so, um, uh, anyway, um, Gardner in his, in his survey, he asks uh, basically whether there's some other maybe family of inequalities that, that kind of unify this hierarchy here, and that's kind of the topic for today's talk. So toward that end, I think it's just, you know, instructive to rewrite the broskamp lieb and Barth inequalities in, in maybe some slightly different form. <clears throat> and so let me start out by writing it like this, that for all non-negative functions f and gj's, I, I'm being a little bit sloppy here and not uh, denoting their, their domains, but, uh, but I defined all this before. Excuse me, I need to get some water. I'll be right back.
Okay, so I guess that's one of the benefits of a uh, virtual presentation is you can run to the kitchen and grab yourself some, some water quick. Okay, sorry about that. So I think it's good to rewrite these inequalities, uh, uh, the process complete inequalities in, in some form that looks like this, where if I have inequalities F1 and GJs that satisfy some pointwise inequality, then this implies this inequality relating the integrals of the functions uh, with sharp constant that be, can be considered by, uh, or computed by considering only centered Gaussian functions. And so again, this is like fairly obvious that it's, that it's equivalent because if I wanna find the sharpest constant here, I'll just choose F1 to be the pointwise largest function that satisfies this inequality. And uh, that's precisely the statement of the Bross camp leib inequalities. <clears throat> Okay, so same with Barth inequalities, I can write them in, in this form. That if I consider non-negative measurable functions, fi's and uh, one function g1, then I can write it like this, that if my function satisfy this pointwise inequality, then it uh, implies that it satisfies this inequality relating the integrals. And so again, the best constant here can be computed by considering uh, only centered Gaussian functions. And, and here, you know, to find the sharpest constant, of course, I'm going to take G1 to be the point my smallest function, satisfying this uh, hypothesis on the left here. And that's precisely the, the funny looking function that appears in Barth's formulation of his inequalities. And so this, uh, you know, once you write them in this common form, you see that uh, it's suggestive of, uh, of some more general, yeah, I guess, uh, common form of inequalities that, that captures these. And so in particular, if we now take functions fi's and gj's, which satisfy, which are assumed to satisfy some, um, some pointwise inequality like this, then we can ask, you know, what's the smallest constant in inequality here such that uh, the integral or the product of the integrals of the fi's is uh, uh, upper bounded by that constant times the product of integrals of the, of the gj's. And so we call these inequalities forward reverse uh, broskamp leib inequalities or FRBL. Um, and this is just, I guess, lack of creativity because uh, sometimes Barth's inequality is called the reverse broskamp leib inequality. So naturally we think of the original broskamp leib inequalities as the, the forward or direct. And so why not call this forward reverse since it kind of covers both cases. <clears throat> And so we define for a datum C, D, and B, D of that datum to be the, the smallest constant here. And then we can also define D subscript G to be the smallest constant holding in this family of inequalities where uh, for the given datum where I restrict my attention to just uh, centered Gaussian functions. Okay, so if we want to state the Gaussian saturation property of the broskamp leib inequalities, then basically in this notation, it just simply says that, uh, you know, I've just got one function on the left here and the best constant in these inequalities is, is uh, computed by uh, restricting attention to Gaussian functions. And similarly, uh, Barth's theorem can be summarized as follows that, that if I'm considering this class of inequalities where I've just got one function on the right here, so M is one, then a uh, smallest constant or a sharp constant in this inequality can be considered by considering only, uh, only Gaussian functions. Okay, so one more thing that I wanna introduce is this notion of a uh, dual datum. And so basically what you notice, it's, a, it's a subtle, but in the, for a datum CDB, the dual datum is defined just by reversing the roles of D and C and uh, considering um, the collection of maps, which are the, the adjoints. And so basically what this datum corresponds to is some instance of the inequalities where all of everything's flipped from left to right in that, in that picture that I showed you. So the idea is that, um, uh, you know, the functions on the left are now functions of, uh, uh, defined on the, the EJs. The functions on the right are now functions defined in the EIs and the maps are sending the EJs to the, to the EIs. And so we can define, you know, the smallest constant in for this uh, as, as before for this, this uh, particular dual datum. And so the motivation for introducing this notation is uh, that Barth's proof of the Gaussian saturation for his inequality actually gave 
gave something more than just Gaussian saturation. He basically showed that the best constants in the forward and in, in, in these particular instances of the forward and reverse uh, brass camp weave inequalities or, or the Barth uh, type inequality for a datum kind of uh, corresponding to one used in the brass camp weave inequalities, he showed that the, the best constants are the same. So namely, you have this inequality holding for all non-negative Gs, if and only if this inequality holds for, for all non-negative Gs. And so, um, you know, if we want to state it in the notation that we introduced, it basically says, in other words, the best constant for the datum with just, uh, you know, k equals one is equal to the best constant in the forward reverse type inequality uh, for the dual datum with now uh, n equals one. So just one, you know, right? So Barth's inequality, uh, or Barth's result, not only established this Gaussian saturation, but but it's really kind of established this uh, mysterious duality, I guess, of, of best constants that uh, for each instance of the Bars camp leave inequality, there's an in instance of the Bars inequality with the same sharp constant and, and the relationship between the data involved are, are basically, you, you just kind of flip that picture that I showed you from left to right. So you, um, you consider maps from, instead of from the EIs to the EJs, from the EJs to the EIs. So, now let me state, I guess, the, the main result here um, that, I, that I want to talk about first is that for now this, uh, you know, general class of forward reverse inequalities, we have this uh, identity here, basically, which, which says that they're extremized by, or that they're saturated by, by considering only Gaussian functions. And then moreover, uh, we extend this, this duality property that was discovered by Barth showing that for any you know, instance of these forward reverse inequalities, if you consider the dual datum, then you again have uh, equality of best constants. So it kind of unifies this, you know, broskamp lieb and Barth type inequalities under you know, a common picture, and it also generalizes this idea of the, the duality or equality of uh, best constants under kind of dual instances of, of the inequality. Okay. Someone says, with respect to this inequality class and with an analogy basic triangle inequality, assuming there's mean value, is there any symmetry associated with range? Okay, so I think I don't fully understand the question, um, but I can come back to it if it's an uh, urgent one. Okay, so let me, you know, parse this for a second, this result, because it, it basically is uh, two parts. And so it says, first of all, if I've got, uh, you know, functions fi's and gj's satisfying this pointwise hypothesis, then it implies that I have this uh, inequality involving the integrals uh, with sharp best constant that can be computed by considering only uh, centered Gaussian functions, the uh, fi's and gj's. And so the second part of this, uh, this statement is this notion of duality that now, you know, it's kind of subtle, but uh, if I consider this, this instance of the forward reverse inequality corresponding to the dual datum, so now you see the roles of the GJs and the FIs are completely reversed and all the maps, they appear as in terms of their adjuvants here. Then if I have this pointwise inequality, then I have this integral inequality and, and the point of the, this uh, duality result here is that uh, the best constants are, are the same. So as I mentioned before, if, if you were to consider the broskamp lieb inequalities, that corresponds to just one function on the left here. Uh, so k equals one. And the Barth inequality would be just one function on the, on the, the right. And, and so it kind of uh, generalizes or extends um, the framework or extends the broskamp lieb and Barth inequalities to a kind of common framework that, uh, that covers this duality also. So, so in pictures, let me go back to this, uh, this image here. And so this again is from Gardner's uh, survey of the minkowski inequality. And so if I just move this down and add the new family of inequalities at the top, then we can write out a whole bunch of new implications. I think and it's good to just, you know, to understand the results to see it in, in visual context. So even if you, you know, don't pay attention to the math, it's, it's okay, you still understand how it fits in. 
And so the idea is if I, again, I'm just moving these things down and then adding some things at the top. Um, so these four reverse inequalities kind of now, you know, as special instances explain Barth inequality, Roskamp Lieb inequality, and other special instances, reverse Young inequality. And then there's also many other inequalities that have appeared in the literature that it also uh, explains as particular instances. There's a nice uh, entropy inequality due to anathrome jog in there. Uh, it can be seen as a special case of it. There's a recent um, paper by Barth and Wolf. Uh, I'm not sure if it's appeared yet, but but um, uh, it's basically the title is Gaussian uh, kernels also have Gaussian minimizers, and their idea was to extend the result of Chen, Daphnis, and Pioris and uh, Barth's inequality. I think that was their motivation, and so it's also a special instance of this. And then I draw a, a broken line here because, in fact. It turns out that you can deduce the Gaussian saturation property uh, of these four reverse inequalities from, from the Barth Wolf inequality, also. Um, hold on, remember that if E. So it's still don't fully understand the question. I think the idea is, is that we should think of like the Broskamp-Lieb inequality as basically extending, like uh, being analogous to something like Holder's inequality or Young's inequality. Okay, so typically there, I mean, so the inequalities as stated involve, um, you know, non-negative functions or can be formulated in terms of non-negative functions. I'm answering Anthony Noriega's question here. And then uh, likewise, I think best way to think about Barth's inequality is extending things like Percopa Leinler. So I don't understand precisely what symmetry you're referring to, but, but in either of these uh, particular instances of the inequalities, do we generally require things to be symmetric in the sense that you're talking about as, as far as I can tell. So let me also point out that the second part of the result was that there was this kind of, um, you know, self-duality of these four reverse inequalities. And by this, I mean that there was this dual duality of best constants between the Barth and broskamp lieb inequalities. And so here within this class, if we consider dual datums, uh, so dual instances of the, of the inequalities, then, then we again have equality of best constants. And so now within this hierarchy here, what this allows you to do is immediately write down dual to, you know, any of these inequalities basically and, and identify best constants. So just as an exercise or as an example, you can do it for reverse Young inequality and you arrive at some new functional inequality that I haven't seen before, but you know, you can immediately write it down with best constant and it looks something like this. Uh, I mean, the details here aren't important, but it's just, the point is it seems to be some new inequality that's dual to reverse Young in, in this sense that we can write down, you know, without proof, basically just uh, in write down the best constants. So I think it just, uh, you know, illustrates perhaps the, the power of, of, of thinking in this way. So the questions that we really want to address here is, um, you know, one, when is the best constant in these types of inequalities finite? So when does integrability of, you know, the the GJs imply integrability of the, the FIs. And for this, uh, we can obtain a really precise characterization. And so again, um, you know, I'm thinking of my special space E0 as being direct sum of these bases EIs. And so I'll just let pi EI, you know, as usual, denote uh, the projection of E0 onto the subspace EI. And so we'll say that the subspace T in E0 is of product form if, if it can be written as direct sum of subspaces of the individual EIs. And then uh, just for notational convenience for my collection of linear maps, I can think about them as, as defining linear maps from this whole space E0. Instead of the individual uh, constituent subspaces, I can think of it as a map from E0 to EJ, uh, just defined as follows. And so with this notation, um, then you have a really simple condition for uh, finiteness of best constant, namely, the best constant in this class of inequalities is finite if and only if your, your C's and D's satisfy some kind of uh, dimension condition here. And the motivation for this is that if they don't satisfy this, you can always dilate functions by some common factor and you'll see that uh, the best constant would necessarily be infinite. 
and then some other inequality involving uh, dimensions of, of subspaces of, of T and, um, you know, basically the image of, of T under, under mappings into these spaces EJs. And so I won't actually talk, say anything about the proof of this particular result, but I, but I just want to point out that we, we know precisely when this constant will be finite. And it generalizes a quite popular result of Bennett, Carver, Kristen Tal from 2008, who basically established the same result for the direct Broskin wave inequalities, namely the, the case k equals one. So there, uh, basically, you just have you know this notion of product form subspace goes away, and it just would say that dimension of t should be less than or equal to the the weighted sum of dimensions of images of t under the various maps. And so it's nice that you see a, a very clean generalization there. And so now let me speak briefly about uh, the proof. I, I you know. Um, Necessarily, there will be a bit of detail, but I, but I want to kind of give the, the high level ideas and, and some of the ideas in the proof are kind of, you know, extensions of what's been done before. And then I would say there's one really, you know, interesting new idea in the proof and that's kind of what I want to focus my, my discussion on. And so Barth's proof of uh, Gaussian saturation of the Broskamp Lieb and Barth uh, inequalities it, it basically uses some Legendre duality of quadratic forms. And, and so this gives the equality of best constants uh, and identifies the structure of the extremizers. Um, and this duality together with uh, some transportation argument is basically what he does. And so in particular in the uh, broskamp lieb and Barth theorems or inequalities, basically the the condition or structure of Gaussian extremizers um, can be characterized by some sort of identity that looks like this. Namely, uh, there exist Gaussians which saturate uh, the inequality and achieve best constant um, if there exists some, some positive definite matrix V which satisfies this, this funny looking thing here. And then these matrices here that are inverted um, basically define the covariances of the, of the Gaussian functions that uh, saturate the inequality. And so somehow this, uh, this, you know, characterizes the structure of the Gaussian extremizers. And so it's kind of like uh, optimality conditions, like KKT conditions or something like that. And, uh, you know, our setting, it turns out, um, requires a little bit more delicate study of the, the duality. So that's kind of where the, the key novelty is. And then, you know, once you establish, um, you know, the result for, for the instances of the inequalities when you know they're extremized by Gaussians or when there exist Gaussians that, that uh, achieve the, the uh, equality with best constant with, with equality. Um, and then there's some kind of abstract machinery developed in this paper by Bennett Carber and Kristen Tao that, uh, that can be extended. So, so my focus, um, so these are kind of like very brief remarks, uh, high level, but my focus is not on like all of the details, but I just wanna, wanna focus on, on the duality um, argument because I think that's most interesting and it's the, it's the, the thing that's uh, novel um, with respect to uh, everything else, I think. <clears throat> and so if we wanna talk about like how this uh, equality or this um, identity should generalize from the regular broskamp lieb type setting to the uh, to the general kind of forward reverse setting. Um, you know, it's it's not immediately obvious, and and so let me describe it for you now. So just to start out, uh, introduce just some very minor notation just for compactness, basically that uh, uh, for brevity, I should say. So basically, if I've got positive definite matrices, these VIs then I just consider this big matrix V subscript C, which is block diagonal matrix with scaled versions of the VIs along the diagonal. And then um, I'll also consider this lambda C to be a diagonal matrix with uh, CIs along the diagonal, basically, um, uh, with blocks of CIs uh, equal to the dimension of the, the individual EIs. So in this notation, um, you can characterize kind of the structure of the Gaussian extremizers uh, as follows. So if you're given a datum, CDB, then it turns out to be, you know, Gaussian extremizable, if and only if this dimension condition holds, which, uh, which we discussed before, so that's not terribly interesting. But also, we require that there exists, uh, you know, 
matrices VIs of dimensions, you know, given by the uh, equal to the dimension of the EIs, and some other matrix sigma, and this is the mysterious part, uh, sigma, which is a positive definite matrix, matrix with these VI inverses along the diagonal, which should satisfy this operator inequality here. And so again, it, it looks kind of complicated. And so the point is not to dwell on the, the actual, um, you know, uh, details here, but, but simply to point out that, that this actually does extend this, this previous uh, thing here, because in, in the case of just k equals one, then there's only one matrix V1, and then sigma is, uh, you know, fixed to be precisely V1 inverse. And so when I plug all those things in, then, then it basically reduces precisely to, to this uh, thing with equality. Okay, so, so yeah, that's the basic idea is that this is the natural way of extending these, uh, these, this characterization of the Gaussian um, extremizers. And the key ingredient is this notion of this, this sigma matrix here. This is the, the non-obvious part. <clears throat> Okay, so let me explain a bit where this comes from. Uh, or let me explain how this, you know, sigma is used. So, so what I want to do is prove for you that if I have matrices VI and sigma that satisfy these things here, this uh, operator inequality here, then basically that the, the inequality will be saturated by, by uh, Gaussian or centered Gaussian functions. So let me give you the idea of that. And it uses, uh, it's based on an idea introduced by uh, Lueck and, uh, but also used by others. I'll, I'll come on down that afterwards. So the basic idea is that uh, our starting point is this variational formula for Gaussian integrals uh, by Bois, Bois and Dupuy and uh, uh, also goes back to Borel, I guess, the history of it. And for us, the basic idea is that, uh, you know, we consider some Brownian motion that time one has, has uh, covariance K. And then you consider some Hilbert space of, of E valued paths. Okay, so E is the, the space that the Brownian motion is taking values in. And so you can equip it with some, some norm that basically looks at the energy of these paths. The, the details here aren't uh, terribly important except for once you define these things, then you can evaluate the, the Gaussian integral of say e to the phi uh, uh, evaluated on this Gaussian w um, as some, like in terms of some variational problem where you supermise over, over all drifts, basically processes ad adapted to the Brownian filtration. Um, and so basically it's a supremum of expectation of, you know, phi with the Gaussian perturbed by the drift and then minus basically the, the energy of the drift. And again, it's, it's not terribly important, the details here, but, uh, you know, this is basically follows from Gerstenau's formula. So now let's see how it applies. And, and I really want to highlight the role of this sigma matrix there in the, in the structure of the Gaussian extremizer. So, so if we assume that my functions f and g satisfy this kind of pointwise hypothesis that, that we're assuming, Okay, and then suppose that there's also these matrices, the VIs and, and the sigma, okay, which satisfies this inequality here. Then in the notation of the previous slide, this actually implies that I have some inequality of, of norms. Okay, so if I have a, a path um, that takes values in E0, then what it tells me is that, uh, you know, basically um, I have some weighted sum of, of norms is controlled by some other weighted sum of norms. And I mean, it uh, looks complicated, but, but this is the basic idea that this operator inequality precisely boils down to, to this here. And so now the trick is as follows. So you define a Brownian motion that takes values in this big space E0, but you, and you, you define it so that way it's marginals on the individual spaces EIs each have covariance of VI inverse. But the idea is that uh, you want this Brownian motion now to be a coupling of these, you know, Brownian motions on these individual EI spaces. And the right coupling to take is precisely the coupling so that with this, this bigger Brownian motion has a uh, covariance sigma. So really, this is the, this is the key idea that you, you um, yeah, basically construct some big, big Brownian motion that has just the right coupling between marginals on the, on the individual spaces. And once you do that, actually, the proof is uh, almost trivial. So, 
you start out and you just, you know, by this uh, variational formula, we can, we can estimate these Gaussian integrals here by, by this quantity on the right, by choosing some drifts where UI is, is a drift um, taking values in, in space EI. And then what I do is I, you know, add up all these guys, uh, thinking about them in orthogonal subspaces, I add them all together and I get some bigger drift U that's, uh, that's in my, my space E0. And then by this norm inequality on this previous slide, what it, what it actually tells me is that when I look at linear maps or particular linear maps of, of this big drift, then there are drifts in these, in these kind of other spaces. And so now I just sum all these estimates up, okay, average them over the CIs. And so that's the first step here. And then I have two things. I, I apply the, the pointwise hypothesis assumed of the FIs and GJs, okay, there. And then I apply this norm inequality on the, on the other paper or other slide here. And once I do that, then I get that this basically you know, weighted sum of logs of these Gaussian integrals of the FIs are upper bounded by the weighted sum of logs of Gaussian integrals of the GJs. And basically you let the time horizon go to infinity, constants cancel out just perfectly and you get something that looks like this, where this is precisely the right constant that, uh, that one can achieve by restricting uh, attention to Gaussian functions. So I realized I was like super fast, but uh, the idea is that actually this argument is inspired directly by an existing proof due to Lueck, to Lueck for um, classical formulations, the standard formulation of Bross, Camp, Wave, and Barth inequality. So, so some may already be familiar with it, but the key novelty is that uh, you know you have to identify the structure of the Gaussian extremizers, which involves this kind of non-obvious uh, notion of this sigma matrix, which which corresponds to some idea of a coupling, basically. So I think that's the that's one of the key ideas. So um, you know, once you have the structure of the extremizers kind of determined, then then also other approaches should, should work. Also, say transportation, you know, heat flow, whatever your your favorite uh, approach is. And so, you know, the mysterious thing now is how do we identify this this funny operator inequality that I claim is characterizing the structure of the Gaussian extremizers? And in Barth's, you know, the analogy to the regular or standard Bross camp leave and Barth inequalities is to use Legendre duality for quadratic forms. And so here, you know, we also establish the structure by some notion of duality, but it's, uh, it's a bit more, more complicated. So let me, let me uh, describe that to you now. And so um, this is where entropy enters, enters the picture. And this is where I become more uh, comfortable because I consider myself information theorist. So, so for X or random vector, say in Euclidean space Rn with density F in say finite second moments, uh, just so that way the entropy is well-defined, we, we define its so-called Shannon entropy as, as this integral minus integral F log F. And so I, I know with some of the previous talks uh, invoked this entropy also, so hopefully it's familiar to people on the call. And so there's a you know, variational formula for Shannon entropy. And it's basically a special case of this Donsker Vard and uh, variational formula, which people are probably familiar with, basically saying that I can write the uh, Shannon entropy as, as some, infimum over suitable functions phi of, you know, log of the exponential integral of phi minus expectation of phi uh, under x. And so if you use this, okay, using this, there's a really, I, I guess, well-known, at least in certain circles, um, duality for the direct bross kemp inequalities in terms of uh, Shannon entropy, okay, and this is due to Carlin and Cordero or Raskin in 2009. And basically the bross kemp inequalities um, can be stated in a, in a dual form in terms of entropy. So it says that, you know, if I have a random vector x1 on e1, then it can be upper bounded by, uh, you know, weighted sum of entropies of, of uh, linear maps of, the, of this vector x1. And so the best constant here in this entropy inequality coincides with the best constant in, in the functional formulation of the bross kemp lieb inequality for the, for the same uh, datum. I should mention that you know, this duality is, is more general than, than what I'm presenting here, but I'm just kind of sticking with the Euclidean case because that's uh, what's, relevant, uh, what's relevant here. But, but you can see the paper by Carlin and uh, Cordero Raskin uh, for more details. 
But the point is, is it's a consequence of this uh, uh, variational formula for Shannon entropy. And so to explain the, the notion of duality that we need, okay, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but, but we should view it through the lens of, uh, of this variational formula for the standard uh, Shannon entropy. And this, you know, the, I would say the simplest explanation of it is, is in the main reference that, I, that I'm kind of presenting today, but also the ideas go back to a conference paper with, uh, also with Lou and his advisors, um, Cuff and Verdu in 2016 and appearing in a journal paper in 2018. So, so the idea, um, you know, has, has been around for a little while, but, but let me uh, describe it because uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the key here. So if we consider x1 through xk to be random vectors on these spaces e1 through a, ek, again, just assume finite second moments, and then now I, now I really use this uh, notation pi to denote couplings. So pi is uh, basically some vector x, okay, which is a, a coupling of the xi's with the, with the given marginals. And so the duality that we need here can be expressed as follows. And again, it, it looks really complicated, so let me walk you through it. But basically it's looking at a weighted sum of entropies Okay, and not entropies of the individual XIs, but entropies of the XIs, you know, transformed by some linear maps. And then I don't just look at this weighted sum of entropies, I have to supervise over all couplings of the XIs. And the duality result is that this expression on the left can be expressed as something on the right, okay, uh, which looks roughly like the variational form for the regular Shannon entropy, but it's infamizing over all functions U and J, U, J and V, I, that satisfies some pointwise inequality. And this pointwise inequality should, no surprise, you know, look kind of familiar at this point, because indeed if I, you know, exponentiate these things and I get functions fi and gj that satisfy the, the pointwise hypothesis in these forward reverse uh, Bruskia believed inequalities. And again, I should just mention that, uh, that the ideas, um, you know, can be extended uh, to more general settings, not just the Euclidean setting. Here, this, this uh, duality is not specific to the Euclidean setting, but that's what I need today. And so again, it, it looks really complicated. So, so let me just explain it simply, or explain one direction of this inequality, or this identity. And so let me show the easy direction. If we take any coupling of the Xi's, then I've got this thing on the left here, and I can apply the variational uh, formulation of, of regular Shannon entropy. So namely, each one of these guys, entropies, is upper bounded by log of, you know, integral of e to the sum function uj, my favorite function uj, uh, such that the integrals are kind of make sense, minus expectation of uj evaluated on this random variable here. So this inequality is just directly from this variational formula uh, for Shannon entropy, where entropy can be written as some infimum over, over functions. And then, now each of these things inside this sum I can apply this assumed pointwise hypothesis satisfied by the UJs and VIs to get this second inequality here. Now, again, this was the assumed set of UJs and VIs that I was, uh, you know, taking the infimum over. So then you see that now supermising over couplings on the left and infimizing over suitable functions UJ and VI on the right, basically what I find is, uh, you know, the, that this thing is less than or equal to this right-hand side. So there's like two pieces here. And so the reverse direction is, is actually the, the difficult one. And it's you know, not obvious until someone tells you that this is precisely what you need, but, but it uses uh, the so-called Fenchel-Rockefeller duality theorem. And so um, if you're familiar with the proof of Kantorovich duality for transportation costs, then th this is also the key duality result used. And so there actually is kind of some kind of uh, uh, similarity here. Namely, we consider what you might consider the, a primal problem involving optimization over couplings and a dual problem involving what you can think of as expectations of functions satisfying some pointwise constraints. And so the idea is actually uh, quite similar, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, here we were interested in, a, in kind of extending this variational formula of of uh, entropy to, to this, you know, notion of kind of maximum entropy over couplings. <clears throat> and so using this, you can write down this uh, kind of completely equivalent uh, 
dual notion of these four reversal inequalities completely in terms of entropies. And so for a given datum, you know, CDB, let me see what time it is, okay, 15 minutes, I can, uh, you know, the best constant D in the functional formulation of the four reverse cross cleave inequalities is also the best constant in this inequality involving entropies. Um, namely, x1 through xk be, you know, marginally specified random vectors on the individual spaces e1 through ak, and it tells me that I'll always have this inequality here, that this weighted sum of entropies is upper bounded by, you know, some uh, uh, weighted sum of entropies maximized over couplings of the xi's, uh, plus some constant, and this, you know, inequality is saturated by considering only Gaussian xi's. So this is like a uh, entropic dual in the spirit of Carlin and Cordero Raskin, but extended to this this uh, notion of these four reverse inequalities. And, and really, the key novelty again is is this appearance of of the coupling, which which arises from this um, you know Fenchel Rockefeller duality. And so now, I, my goal here, uh, you know, is was to explain how we arrived at you know this expression or this characterization of the Gaussian extremizers. And the idea is that you know you can think about the functional formulation of these inequalities as a primal problem and then this you know entropic formulation as a dual problem and when you pass from one to the other you you get some optimality conditions or that naturally fall out and it's it's precisely this operator inequality that that looked so complicated and again the details are not so important but think of them as basically kkt conditions where you pass from the, from the primal problem to the dual problem and, uh, or I should say optimality conditions, maybe it's something like complementary slackness or something. And then, um, so the role of this sigma matrix was quite, uh, I guess, mysterious in the functional formulation of the problem. But in this entropic formulation, it's actually very clear what the role of this sigma is. And this sigma is the corresponds to the optimal uh, coupling of Gaussians that, uh, that maximizes this entropy here, or you know, supervises the entropy here, and also the the marginals of this, you know, Gaussian vector on E zero are the x size on the left hand side. So, so the sigma is is basically the Gaussian extremizer in in this uh, inequality here that achieves uh, the uh, equality with with best constant. So this is really like uh, yeah, this notion of the coupling emerging from this central Rockefeller duality is is really the key idea I, I would say and and what um, what is not not entirely obvious from from the outset and so now in my remaining minutes let me just uh, basically give some applications so so no more no more details of proofs or anything like that just some some applications of the ideas so so one and you know like i said i'm an information theorist so i'm particularly interested in applications to entropy inequalities and so uh, one application is as follows if we let x1 through xk be real valued random variables, and then let xs uh, denote the collection of random variables indexed by subset s, and then consider some function uh, eta, which just sends subsets of one through k to you know, extended non-negative real numbers, and let pi, okay, so basically couplings of x1 through xk with this eta at the end, uh, denote the set of couplings that satisfy this inequality. And this thing on the left here is relative entropy, okay? And then the p's here denote the, these are the marginal laws of the xi's, and this is the joint law of the, the uh, collection of random variables xs. And so what you should just think of this is, is that we're constraining the set of couplings so that we, you know, individual subsets are constrained to be kind of quantitatively close to independent, um, you know, with respect to this notion of relative entropy. So you can just think of it as yeah, a set of couplings where we look at subsets of random variables and, and demand that that subset look uh, close to product distributed um, uh, in this sense of relative entropy. And so once we define this, then a consequence of the previous results, uh, you know, we haven't published it anywhere, but, uh, but it's not uh, too difficult to obtain, is a nice inequality that looks like this. So for any, you know, random variables real valued x1 through xk with finite entropies in second moments. We let uh, g1 through gk be Gaussians with uh, the same entropies, okay? Then for any non-negative numbers d1 through dm in linear maps, uh, aj's which map basically the xk's to, to some other uh, space r to the nj, I get this inequality here that uh, this weighted sum of entropies 
maximized over couplings. Is upper bounded by this weighted sum of entropy is also maximized over couplings. And of course, this inequality is sharp because if I take the, the xi's to be Gaussian, then I, then I just get uh, equality here. And so if you're familiar with kind of the literature in this area, you might immediately recognize that if I take eta equal to zero, then it uh, you know, demands that the xi's are all independent. And this is precisely something known as a zamir fetter uh, inequality. And this you know, includes a special case, so-called shannon Stam or Lieb uh, inequality for entropies. And perhaps not entirely obvious by looking at this, it also includes a uh, Brum-Minkowski inequality as a special case. And so I think this last point uh, bears uh, some significance. So, so let me expound upon it uh, just a little bit. And so if I take this previous result, then as a corollary, if I take random vectors x, y, and rn, and I denote the, you know, some of you may or may not be familiar with this notion of mutual information between x and y, which is just the relative entropy between the, uh, the joint law and the, and the product of the marginals. And then I define this uh, quantity nx, the so-called entropy power of x. And uh, yeah, these are all quite standard notions. And so a corollary of the previous result is this kind of interesting looking inequality here, that if x and y are marginally specified random vectors, uh, each of dimension n with finite second moments, then for any choice of eta between zero and plus infinity, I have this in, in, inequality here, okay? And the right-hand side, the supremum is over all couplings of the involved vectors x and y, such that the mutual information is less than or equal to eta. Okay, so, so eta is just a real number and it constrains the dependence here. So we can think of this as like an entropy power inequality for uh, dependent random variables. But in general, we have to look and optimize over all couplings um, on the right-hand side that satisfy our, our constraint uh, on, the, on the dependence as measured under mutual information. In particular, if we take uh, you know, eta equals zero, this just means that x and y will be independent and the above, you know, this term goes away and it reduces to this you know, Shin and Stam entropy power inequality, which many of you are probably familiar with. Now, on the other hand, uh, you know, if we take eta equal infinity, then this term goes away right here, and then you recognize this thing is, can be, the left-hand side can be written as a square. And all of the, the exponents, the two in the exponents of the entropy power, entropy powers cancel. And uh, then what we get is this inequality here, where now I'm taking the supremum over all couplings of x and y. And so it says the you know, square root of entropy power of x plus square root of entropy power of y is at most a uh, square root of entropy power of x plus y, um, provided I, I maximize over, over the couplings of x and y. And this actually implies brun minkowski because if I let x be uniformly distributed on some compact set k, y be uniformly distributed on some compact set l, okay, then this thing on the left is just volume of k to the one upon n. This thing right here is volume of l to the one upon n. And then the sum of x plus y will clearly be you know, supported on the Minkowski sum of k plus l. And so this entropy is upper bounded by a uh, log volume of k plus l for, for any coupling. And so we get the brown minkowski inequality out of this. So I think this is actually quite interesting because um, you know, it's been known for a long time that you can derive the shannon stam inequality and the brown minkowski inequality kind of as endpoints of Young, uh, Young's inequality for convolutions when you take different limiting um, choices of parameters. But when stated in entropy is you end up getting an inequality involving Rennie entropies of various orders. And so it's kind of cheating because it's not really just the inequality like involving like just Shannon entropies. It's, it's really just, you know, disguising um, a bunch of uh, norms of densities as, as Rennie entropies and then taking you know, limits. And here we get a family of inequalities that's completely in terms of, uh, of Shannon entropies and mutual information. And it, uh, it, it includes both this, uh, you know, usual Shannon entropy power inequality and brown minkowski inequality as, as special cases. So I think, you know, this is, uh, this is quite interesting, at least to me. And so, <clears throat> let's see, I'm, I've got just a few minutes left and that's good because I'm just about out of slides. So, now I'm going to present a slide that's a bit speculative, okay, and, I, and 
I thought that, you know, there's a lot of people here. Well, I don't know, maybe people got sick of listening to me and tuned out. But, uh, but anyway, the, the idea is that in the usual Broskamp Lieb and Bartha inequalities, there are special instances of inequalities known as geometric inequalities. And those are precisely the inequalities where the best constant d is equal to zero. Okay, so, so you end up with kind of no, con no prefactor in the, in the right hand side in the functional formulation of these inequalities, or prefactor equal to one, e to the zero. And so you can also formulate ge the kind of, you know, uh, natural extension of these geometric instances in terms of the forward reverse inequalities. And I mean, maybe it's just preference because I like thinking in terms of entropies, but, but I think um, the idea here is I'm going to state the formulation of the geometric inequalities and, and then maybe someone can answer a question for me. Okay, so the idea here is we fix linear maps, okay, AJs, which send the space E0 to EJ. And I want to assume that these linear maps define a contraction in, in some particular sense, okay. And uh, then the other thing is that I want to assume is that there's a random vector Z, okay, uh, that takes values in E0, such that the marginal of Z on each space EI is isotropic. And if I look at the image of Z under uh, the map AJ, that it's also isotropic for each J. And moreover, the Z should satisfy uh, equality in this, in this kind of uh, inequality above, um, almost surely. Okay, so if these two conditions are satisfied, then this corresponds to the kind of these, uh, this notion of geometric instances of, of the inequalities and, and the resulting entropy inequality that I get is, is written down below that for any random vectors XI, you know, taking values in EI, this weighted sum of entropies on the left is less than or equal to the weighted sum of entropies on the right, uh, you know, where I now have to optimize over all couplings x of the, uh, with uh, coordinates x1 to xk. So the idea here is that my question for you, as I said, this is a bit speculative, is is there some sort of physical or statistical mechanic interpretation to this, um, you know, class of inequalities. And I have this like burning feeling or sensation that, uh, that there should be, but I can't quite put my finger on it. And to me, this, I want to think about the XIs as basically, you know, describing the state of my system and then the AJs uh, describing the dynamics of the system over time. And so I think of this first condition as saying that the system is dissipative in the sense that like the, the energy is being reduced in, in time. And then the second uh, criteria is in some sense saying that there exists uh, some notion of equilibrium for the system. Namely, you know, there's, there's some state or distribution over states that the energy is conserved. And then also, if you're familiar with this notion of energy part, uh, equipartition theorem uh, for say Hamiltonian mechanics or whatever. So if you take um, you know, some system uh, in equilibrium, then what it says is that, uh, you know, representing a suitable basis, things will look isotropic. And so I have this like, you know, I can't quantify it or I can't uh, put my finger on it exactly, but, but I feel like there should be a very, you know, to the right person, they'll immediately see the, the correct physical intuition for, for what these things are saying. And, and I, I can't quite figure it out, but, uh, but I have a feeling it should be saying something interesting now. That's all I'll say uh, on that. Um, you know, no theorems or anything else. Uh, but uh, I feel like this could be an interesting question to look at. And I think it's just one of understanding the conditions and what physical, you know, situation they map to. And so, you know, if I want to give a summary of the talk, I'll just put this picture back up, which basically is that we, you know, I know it was fast. Uh, maybe that's the nature of giving a slide presentation rather than writing on the board as a, you know, I have the luxury of speeding through things, but, you know, we have this family of forward reverse inequalities um, that really kind of unify the, this landscape of other inequalities. It, it really, you know, uh, you know, implies all of these other things as special cases. It kind of really clarifies the duality and joy between, you know, equality of best constants on Barth and Broskamp Lieb inequalities. And then it also has this nice, uh, you know, dual in a different sense uh, notion of, you know, counterpart inequality state in terms of entropies. And so with that, uh, I will conclude. I'm out of time. And let me just point out that the main reference for this paper involving mostly the analysis of the functional formulation of these inequalities uh, appeared in Journal of Geometric Analysis this year, but actually some of the key ideas go back to a previous paper uh, with, uh, also with Jingbo uh, Lu. And uh, you can find that in the references. And I should say that, you know, um, 
you know, probably selfishly in the interest of trying to uh, cover as much content as possible, I didn't do any justice to, uh, you know, describing the history of this area or the, uh, you know, all of the contributions of individual people, but uh, it's explained a little bit in the paper and um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments, remarks? The proof of breast cum lib, with which I'm familiar, goes like that. You invent a certain flow, a certain sort of heat flow, but it's not exactly heat flow, but yeah. it's kind of skewed heat flow. And then breast cum lib is just monotonicity. Right. Flow. Well, can, can it be done sort of in this more general case? Yeah, so, so I think, let me, let me go to the relevant slide here and, and explain. Um, so as you point out, yeah, I guess, you know, the traditional proof of Broskamp Lib, uh, I guess you could uh, talk about, uh, you know, rearrangement based proofs. And then, you know, kind of the popular proof is that where you, you know, basically look at some sort of heat flow, okay? And then you, you obtain some monotonicity, uh, or use some maximal principle basically, and then in the in the limits, you know, you get these function or these integrals as the means. Now, the the heat flow approach also the idea is you you basically set it up in a way that appeals to the optimality conditions. So, so in particular in the the original Broskamp Lieb inequalities, uh, this particular identity some in a certain way characterizes the Gaussian extremizers. And so this, you know, you use to basically define your flow and uh, or your flow kind of the structure of it is, you know, based on uh, or uses this in a, in a crucial way. And so I think that, you know, if I understand what you're asking, could you do something similar here? And I, I, I believe the answer is yes, that you could look at these more general optimality conditions and set up some sort of uh, heat flow type argument. And again, I believe the, the conclusion should boil down to some sort of application of maximal principle uh, or you know, monotonicity or whatever. Um, now, uh, how to do it, I don't know. In fact, I, I kind of spent some time in trying to figure out how to do it, but I'm like n not an expert in, in these things. So, so I, I couldn't figure it out. So someone probably even in attendance here could probably you know, look at the refined optimality conditions for these four reverse cases and, and immediately figure out what the argument should be. But, but I don't understand how to do it. The, the way that at least seems simplest to me and the way that, you know, uh, I was able to immediately see how to extend was this, this argument of Lueck. And also I should mention, um, you know, a, a very similar argument. We didn't know about it until after we wrote the paper, but a similar argument also appeared in this paper by Cordero Ruskin and, and, and Mori in 2017. But the thing that they were missing there was the, the you know, the precise characterization of these extremizers that, uh, that uh, from which this kind of notion of maximum entropy coupling emerges. And, and we use in the proof here to get the, the sharp constant. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. So Thank you. it should be possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things I would suggest in that direction is if you go to this entropic dual formulation is the one that mm -hmm. Dario and I came up with, then it is an actual heat flow. If you do brass camp lead directly, it's a nonlinear heat flow, right? But, but one of the things that makes it simpler, and this is something that Elliot and I took advantage of in a non-commutative setting because a nonlinear heat flow would be rather hard to work with there. But the, one of the advantages of the dual version is it has a much simpler heat flow proof. And yeah, so I, I think- would be true with your dual version of forward reverse, but since you have one, you could probably do it with a linear heat flow, I would suspect there. Yeah, so actually I did give some thought to this, but, but I kind of run into problems. So, so I think in one sense in, okay, so you're testing my memory and you are clearly more of an expert than I am. So if I'm wrong, you know, uh, feel free to, to let me know. But, but I think, um, you know, the idea there is that in these, you know, when you look at flow type arguments on entropies, um, then the idea is you use this De Bruijn identity where, you know, now you look at the derivative of the flow and it becomes some statement in terms of Fisher informations. And this is just basically an L2 type inequality, which, which then matches up with the, you know, uh, characterization of the extremizers in a certain sense. At least that's the way how, how I view it. Now, the difficulty here is this supremum over couplings. So if I were to look at a flow where I evolve, you know, the XIs by perturbing them by adding some Gaussian, okay, with variance proportional to T, then I, I don't really understand or I, you know, I, I wasn't able to figure out 
could get some nice fish information quantity out of this because depending on the time of your flow, I mean, it changes the optimal coupling of the of the X's. So, so it wasn't at least obvious to me that you would immediately get some sort of L2, you know, fissure information type of, of inequality when you when you look at kind of the derivative of the entropies along the flow. So that's my high level response. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but but that's at least the difficulty is the presence of that supermum over couplings there. I, I see. So it's not clear to me why the fissure you would need would change over time, because I mean the extremals are the extremals, and you use a you use a heat flow that takes you to to the extremals, and then there should be a fissure information inequality for that that just propagated along the semi group. But but maybe I'm yeah, not interested in something. I would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I mean. I think that's the right idea that if you know you you consider the flow uh, on the extremizers and everything remains invariant and it's and it's okay. But if you consider a flow that's taking you to the extremizers, you know this optimal coupling defined de, uh, you know defined by the sigma matrix, then then basically as you flow your initial data or as you kind of evolve your initial data over time, then then the coupling of you know those individual marginals it, it seemed to me at least could change, but. But I don't know. I, I recommend you take a look at it because something that uh, might be impossible for me would maybe take you, uh, you know, an hour or something like that. So, okay. Well, anyway, very interesting talk. Thanks for attending. Any other questions or comments? I have a slightly different question. Uh, I know that Brascombe leap is uh, equivalent to this entropy in the fault is that people write and you also presented. But there is also Brascombe leap with Gaussian kernels where Gaussian kernels have only Gaussian maximizers and there are yeah. Gaussian kernels with uh, complex matrices. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't. So my my question is: Is there equivalent version of that fault with complex matrices in terms of entropies or some Fisher information? Is there, I know that these probabilistic approaches they fail when there is some complexity, but yeah. So now it's like definitely outside of my comfort zone uh, dealing with complex things, <laughs> and so I I have had this on my uh, you know list of things to do for a long time to try and understand whether there's some appropriate extension. In, in that sense, but but I, I can't say anything intelligent about it. Now, as to your comment, just in the real case, where we consider uh, inequalities involving Gaussian kernels, so basically you integrate uh, against some Gaussian measure or whatever, um, the uh, similar things can be, can be stated. In fact, it, it kind of falls out of this, uh, this stochastic proof um, you know, basically, if you were to not take the time horizon to infinity, then you would involve or get some inequality involving, you know, the FIs in integrated against some Gaussian measures. But the Gaussian measures have a very particular choice of, of uh, covariance matrices. And so, you know, if you want to just try to write down the family of inequalities that would be satisfied where you've got, you know, your datum consisting of C, D, all these linear maps, B, and then you want to integrate against arbitrary Gaussian measures, for example, uh, with arbitrary covariance matrices, and then I don't know how to do it. But, but there is a particular you know, choice of Gaussian measures uh, for, which, um, for which the same argument basically works and, and gets you there. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately for the complex case, I, I, I can't say anything. I, I don't know. It's on my list of things to think about, but I just have never quite uh, got there. Thank you. Very nice talk. Any other questions? Yeah, so I'm really interested though. I, I know that, you know, Eric Carlin is on the talk and so is Elliot Lieb, um, you know, so clearly they have much more uh, insight into this, whether there's some sort of physical interpretation for these geometric instances of the inequality. And, you know, in thinking about this, I, I don't know. I learned a lot about physics, okay, but uh, I still can't put my finger on what exactly is the right interpretation. But, uh, but I have the feeling one should be able to say something interesting, but I, I don't know what it is. Okay, so any other questions? Thanks all for attending. I really appreciate it. I know, um, yeah, and the slides will be posted online in case if you want to look through at a slower pace than what I delivered. Ah, great talk, great talk. 
Okay, so no other questions? If not, let's thank Tom again. Uh, I suppose many people have thanked him already in the chat as well. By the way, I should, I, you know, I gave credit to him at the beginning, but uh, Jingbo Lu, who was a student at Princeton and is now just joined the faculty of UIUC, he was really, you know, instrumental in a, in a lot of this also. So, um, you know, he's, uh, he deserves a lot of credit also. So that's all I'll say. Okay. Thank you all for attending. So we'll see you next week again. Have a nice uh, afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks again for the invitation.